Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag on this Friday, October the 25th, 2013. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief over here at uh, AMC Movie News. And you might be wondering, why is it Mailbag today? Why is it not AMC Movie Talk? Uh, fair question. Uh, so here's what's happening. Uh, today, Friday, I am actually out of town. And uh, Chris Lee is also out of town. I actually sent Chris Lee to New York to cover the uh, the junket for the upcoming Disney film uh, Frozen. Um, Amy Rose is kind of under the weather. A couple of people from the studio are actually off at a conference. So I just decided, you know what, let's not do movie talk then on Friday. Um, and we'll we'll skip that. But I didn't want to leave everybody in lurch. Who wants a Friday without some movie discussion. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do a mailbag episode for Friday anyway. Now, uh, I know a couple of big things have gone on in the world of movie news, including one of the biggest ones that J.J. Abrams and uh, and Lawrence are gonna be now writing the remainder of Star Wars Episode Seven, and Arndt is now off of it. Uh, we will get to that on Monday, and we'll have the full panel discussion on that on Monday. But I thought today we would do a mailbag. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the show, mailbag is a much more casual, just laid back. It's just me sitting here with you, just talking movies, taking your mailbag questions. So um, hopefully you don't mind that it's just me. And we're going to talk movies for the next, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get through the next bunch of questions. But let's get started, shall we? The first question today comes to us from Bailey. And Bailey writes, I love your guys' show and I watch it every day. Thank you so much, Bailey. I was curious, since it's Halloween time, is there a chance for a possible reboot or remake of the horror cult classic An American Werewolf in London? I think with technology these days, it would be awesome to see that famous transformation on the big screen again. Keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Bailey. Um, I, I, I know I've mentioned this on AMC Movie Talk at least a couple of times, maybe even in Mailbag. American Werewolf in London is my all-time favorite horror movie. To this day, if it's on, at, I, I can be up in Canada at my parents' place, sitting up in the middle of the night watching TV because of jet lag or the time difference, whatever. And if American Werewolf in London is on, I will still be as creeped out as hell and I'll have to turn the lights on. And that's the only movie I can think of in my life that when it's on, I got to have the lights on. For some reason, that movie spooks me like no other movie ever created spooks me. And it might have had something to do with thinking. I was really young when I saw it for the first time. And it practically, you know, traumatized me. And maybe that's why I still find it so creepy. But seriously, the only film to me that has creeped me out as much or close to as much um, in the past, I don't know, forever, is maybe The Descent that came out like five years ago. Uh, maybe it's like six years ago now for the descent. Um, but but other than the descent, it's the American War from London. And but let's not forget that it wasn't all that long ago that there was a pseudo sequel to that, and it was called an American Werewolf in Paris. And not a lot of people were very interested in it. And in the last couple, in the past decade or so, there have been a couple of werewolf movies, including that one with Anthony Hopkins and Benicio del Toro. Um, that did not do great. And because of those things, the fact that there was kind of a sequel that didn't do all too well, the fact that there's been a couple of other werewolf films that haven't necessarily done too well, and the fact that right now there's a different association with werewolves that's kind of the more young adult glittery vampire type of werewolves. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think we're going to see an American Werewolf in London remake, at least not in the foreseeable future, maybe not in the next five, six, seven years. But at hopefully at some point, the werewolf will return and uh, we'll get some great werewolf movies and maybe one of them will be an American Werewolf in London. But if you haven't seen the original, I highly recommend you go out and check out the original American Werewolf in London because it's pretty damn good. Before I read the next question, I'm going to take a quick drink of water. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Sahil C who writes... I love your show so much, and I'm caught up on it, even though I still haven't seen the two new episodes of The Walking Dead. High praise, Sahil. Thank you so much. Um, every few years, we get similar movies that come out just a few months apart from each other, like Olympus Has Fallen and White House Down, or The Illusionist and The Prestige. Usually when this happens, the first of the two movies tends to take away the box office gross of the second movie. Do you guys think it is possible for Need for Speed 
to take away anything from Fast and the Furious 7 next year. I know that Fast 6 came close to 800 million worldwide and Need for Speed will be lucky to make a fraction of that, but I just saw the first trailer for Need for Speed and it actually looks pretty darn good. What do you guys think? Well, I, I'm going to agree with you actually, The the um, at least as far as this goes. The first trailer that has come out for Need for Speed starring Aaron Paul um, does look pretty darn good as a matter of fact. It, it, it looked better than I thought it would, let's put it that way. Now, that being said, so Need for Speed is, I think it's, now I believe that Need for Speed is going to end up being, pardon me, a better movie than I initially thought it was, because that first trailer looks pretty good. You know, I'm dying to see how Aaron Paul does post um, Breaking Bad in his career now. Now that Breaking Bad's done, let's see where he goes. He's a very cool dude. Um, so it's that's going to be better than I think a lot of people are expecting. That being said, no. Fast and the Furious 7 has absolutely nothing to fear from Need for Speed. Look, Need for Speed's going to do its business. And maybe it'll be poor. Maybe it'll be a blockbuster. But it won't have any effect. Trust me. When you're talking about um, Olympus Has Fallen and White House Down, okay? Two similar movies, but there were two unknown properties. And people go to see one, the first one that comes out. So they go see Olympus Has Fallen and think... I don't need to go see another one that just comes out a few months later. Maybe they skip seeing the second one. Okay, I get it. That makes sense. But there's an audience, a very big audience out there right now that is going to go see Fast and the Furious 7 regardless of what it opens against, regardless of what opens right before it, or regardless of what opens a few months before it. The need for speed, uh, success or failure, and let's hope success, so the success of Need for Speed, if it is successful, will not affect in any way Fast and Furious 7. Because like you pointed out, this is not an unknown property. Like those other ones you mentioned, whether it's um, you know Volcano and Dante's Peak, or whether it's um, Armageddon and whatever the one was with Morgan Freeman as the President of the United States, the other asteroid movie. You know, these were all unknown films going at it, and they happen to have the same theme, so one's going to affect the other. Fast and the Furious 7 is a blockbuster, well-established, and beloved franchise. So while I, Need for Speed does look better than I thought, even if it is a great success, trust me, it will have no impact, no negative impact whatsoever on Fast and the Furious 7. Thanks for the question. All right, the third question today comes to us from Preston Porter. And Preston Porter writes... My question doesn't pertain to the movie aspect or anything like that. It's more to do of wanting a job at AMC. I'm 21 and I've been in college for three years and just recently decided to major in mass communications with a minor in film. I really love films and I have close to 600 in my collection. I'm also a big fan of AMC Movie Talk and I love how talking about movies with other people who love film is part of their job. Obviously, I realize your job entails more than that, but I love that part and I'd love anything else that has to do with it, with working in the film industry and so on. I want to know if the majors I've chosen are the right things to major in and I want to know how I would go about working for AMC as my future place of employment. Well, um, Preston, I'm, let's, I'm going to make the wild assumption that when you say working at AMC is a part of your future employment, you're talking about AMC Movie Talk, not necessarily an AMC theater. Uh, and AMC theaters are great places to work. Uh, but I'm th going to think you're talking more about along the lines of my job and what uh, we do here at AMC Movie News. Um, as far as are you taking the right things in school? Those sound good to me. Mass communication is excellent. Uh, minoring in film, excellent. Another one that would also be excellent is a journalism degree. I know when I'm interviewing people for potential uh, jobs with me, uh, that always catches my attention. When there's a journalism degree attached to that, catches my attention. I've hired people on that basis alone before. Um but there's a couple of different ways to answer. The reason I'm, a, I'm taking this question out of the mailbag is because I get a lot of questions just like this one. A lot of people often ask uh, John or ask Dennis or ask Schnepp or ask you know Amy Rose, how can I do what you do? And uh, why you'd want to do what we do, I don't know. But uh, if you're certifiably insane like us, then maybe you do. So uh, here's let me give you my career path, how I got here. 
okay? And, and I think this will also reflect on what I look for when I'm looking to hire people. Um, I, my background is, is in uh, several different things. I have a background, you know, I was a, a, a producer at a visual effects company for a while. I, I also worked, I was working in law when I started a, um, a movie blog. I started a, a movie blog called The Movie Blog and back in 2003. And I was doing that uh, just as fun because movies are my passion, my passion. My earliest childhood memory is my mom um, taking me to see the original Star Wars. And well, part of the reason why you see a shirt like this on me. Um, so I started a movie blog just for fun. Had like 15 people reading it. Awesome. Yay. I was so excited. And this is while I was doing my regular job. So anyway, um, about a year later, I got like a hundred and, or a year or two later, whatever, I had like 250,000 viewers or readers of my site. So it'd grown a lot. And I was even making a little bit of money on it. Like I was doing some advertising on it and I was making like 400 bucks a month in advertising. That's cool. I mean, considering it was a side thing, but I still have my job at the law firm. But anyway, at that point, a couple of friends of mine held an intervention with me. They took me out to lunch one day and they said, John, you are more crazy about movies than anybody else we know. You're having some success with this movie blog thing. You need to quit your job and do it full time. And it probably wasn't the wise thing for me to do. Um, so I quit my job to do full time with my movie blog that was making $400 a month. I moved into like a 300 square foot bachelor apartment with no bedroom or anything in it because I needed to make my money stretch. I was going to live off savings. And I thought, you know, I'll do this for a while just for fun until my savings run out. Then I'll go back to work. But, you know, a year after that, or a year and a bit more after that, I had a million readers a month. And then, you know, I, I started the world's first movie podcast. Um, and we won podcast of the year, not just movie podcast of the year. We won podcast of the year against, we were nominated against my hero, my, my podcasting hero, uh, Leo Laporte, who runs twit. If any of you are techies and you follow the twit network, um, and we beat his podcast twit this week in tech. And still to this day, the most exciting moment of my film blogging career was finding out that we had one podcast of the year and especially what an honor it was to be in the same category as my hero, who is, you know, a thousand times better at this than I am. But um, so there, so then there was that. And then Time Magazine did an article with me and opportunities opened. Anyway, fast forward now another year or two and AMC uh, eventually gets a hold of me and says, we want to start an online thing. Will you come and do this? Now, between then and then, between, you know, the podcast of the year and when AMC called me, you know, I had won several things like G4 called the movie blog, the, the best movie news site um, on the internet, along with uh, Slash Film and one other, I can't remember what the other one was, but we all tied for that. Uh, I think we came in second in Total Film Magazines for best movie news site on the web. Uh, we listened to Movie Maker Magazine's sites uh, for, for filmmakers need to read. Um, USA Today called us the site of the day, uh, the London Telegraph called us best podcast on the web, blah, blah, blah. So all these different types of things happen. Then AMC reaches out to me, says, Hey, we want to start an online thing. Will you come and help us do it? I say, yes. So here I go. Now, the reason I tell you all of that is because I didn't go to school for what I do now. Um, I went to school for two different things after high school. I did two different things. One, I studied theology. And uh, second, I studied law. So, uh, and, and that's kind of weird when you look at me. But, so when I personally am looking at resumes and I'm hiring people, I, I do look for the education because it's always a bonus, right? If I see somebody, they're serious enough about their life and their career and they've got their life together enough that they know it's smart to go to school, that means something. If they've got like a journalism degree, that's great. Film, uh, communications, things like that, that's all great. But what I normally tell people when they ask me, John, how can I get to doing into what you're doing? What I normally tell them is this, and it's, it's not a coincidence that it's kind of the same career path I took. I tell them, start a movie blog. It's free, just do it. Do it because you're passionate about it. Do it because you love film. Just start writing a movie blog and do it for a year or two, 
or three. And then see if you can develop, let's see if your ability to communicate your passion is enough that you start to get a little bit of an audience. You don't have to get a million people. Well, let's see if you can get like 100,000 readers a month. Let's see if you can get like 150, 250,000 readers a month. And then once you've done that for a year or two, then go to sites like AMC Movie Talk or go to Slash Film or go to, you know, um, Coming Soon or go to Empire or go to Total Film or go to any type of site. Um, Cinema Blend's another really good one. Collider is a good one. There's a lot of great ones out there. And that way, when you go, you're not just going as some guy saying, I love movies. Can you give me a job? No. You say, hey, I love movies. I'm passionate about movies. Here's the proof that I'm passionate. I've been doing this blog as a passion project. Here's examples of my work. Here's how I've developed and grown. And as you can see, I've already attracted a little bit of an audience. And to me, that's always been the biggest thing. Like I've only hired uh, a, an associate editor three times. And each time they have been people with experience and have done this stuff and are passionate about film. They have all three, you know, whether it was with a, a George Routh or whether, whether it was with Roth Cornett, who's now over at IGN, or whether it was now with Amy Rose Eisenbach, who I got from IGN and had been with Warner Brothers and stuff like that before. That to me, if I'm looking for a writer, not just a host, like a Chris Lee or something like that. But if I'm looking for a writer and a contributor, I'm looking for that. You know, Dennis Zen is our production manager, but he also runs Think Hero, a fantastic pop culture, media, movies, and TV site. I mean, he knows everything. So, I mean, that's what I look for. So my advice to you is, I think your majors sound great. Those are good. Finish your program, graduate. And I would encourage you that in the meantime, start doing work in film, even if it's not a job. Start a movie blog. Write every day on it and just develop your skill, develop your craft. Hopefully you can start to build an audience. And then when you're ready to go out and try to get a job at one of these types of sites, then you've got examples. Here's what I have been doing. And uh, I think that increases your chances. Anyway, uh, I probably went on too long in that answer because a lot of you don't care or aren't looking for a career in movie blogging, but I just wanted to address that. Thanks for bearing with me. All right. The next question today, the fourth on our list comes to us from Debbie Schultz and Debbie writes, Hey, MC movie crew, you guys have mentioned you get thousands of emails a week from viewers. And John, I know you've been doing movie blogging for over 10 years now. My question is, what is the most annoying trait you often see in movie fans? I'm sure you've seen a few. Love the show. Um, thanks a lot for the question, Debbie. And yeah, I mean, look, let's face it. Um, us movie fans, we have some amazing qualities. And like any other group and subgroup and sub-subgroup of people, we have some annoying traits. Um, and, you know... That's fine. I mean, one of the most annoying, I'll get to my most annoying in a second. One of my most annoying, that I really, really hate is, you know, you, somebody asks you to give a top 10 list, you give a top 10 or you give a top five or somebody asks you, you to name your favorite, this or that. And you do. And then somebody goes, you didn't put, you know, Martin Scorsese's whatever film on your list. Therefore, and here's the big magic word, your list is has, you know, you lost credibility. That's, that's the word. It's either invalid or credibility. That's the thing. When people who generally have no idea what they're talking about, um, will go, you know, you make a list of top 10 superhero films. It's like, oh, you put X-Men first class at number seven instead of number five. Therefore you're, you lost credibility. It's like, really, are you that big of a moron that you do you believe the horse crap that's coming out of your pie hole right now? Do you, do you really think that? Because, because that guy's list, he has something at number seven that you have at number three that makes his list lose credibility because, because your list is the standard of what credibility is. You know, it all comes down to that whole thing I'm always chanting about. My mantra, film is subjective. There's no such thing as an objective list of film. There's just not. If it can't be measured, then it's subjective. Simple as that. You can measure. I still have people try to tell me, by the way, no, no, John, Citizen Kane is objectively a good movie. No, it's not. 
Look, you can, I can objectively tell you how tall this wall is because we can take a measuring tape and objectively, quantifiably measure the height of this wall. And if you can't do that, if you can't objectively and quantifiably measure something, then it's not objective. It is then by definition subjective means it's open to opinion and interpretation. So that's why I laugh. That annoys me a lot. But let me tell you my most annoying habit of film fans. And look, I'm going to tell you right now, it's confession time. I have done this too. And you have done this. We've all done this, but it is nonetheless the thing that annoys me most about us as film fans. Okay. And here's what I mean. It goes back to the subjective thing about film again, right? And here's, here's where this, this drives me crazy. Um, if I say it, it's people who get offended or really riled up or angry or want to condemn you to hell because of an opinion you have about movies that drives me crazy. And now that sounds, it's an awful lot like people saying, Oh, then you don't have credibility. It, they're kind of the same thing. They're kissing cousins. There's that. And this whole thing about people who get angry at you because you have a different opinion about film than they do. These people both make me laugh and drive me nuts because, you know, I, there's, here's a couple of great examples. Number one, everybody knows I love the dark Knight. All right. I love, I think it's the best of the series. Uh, between Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, and The Dark Knight Rises. I thought The Dark Knight Rises was the weakest. I thought The Dark Knight was the strongest of them. I think it's a great film. I mean, I've seen it so many times. I love that movie. But I'm the type of guy who, even if it doesn't matter what the movie is, I will sit here and tell you exactly what the weaknesses are about the movies I love because I know it doesn't change the fact that I love them. So, I've had discussions with people and I've said online, you know, Dark Knight, awesome film, loved it. This is so great. This is so great. This is so great. But I believe it's a little overrated. And I believe there are certain flaws in the film, you know, that this and this and this, and I won't go into a big diatribe about the Dark Knight because I love the film, but you know, I thought there were flaws and I think it is a little bit overrated, blah, blah, blah. Well, you think that would just mean somebody would say to me, well, John, I disagree. I think The Dark Knight is a, a pretty much a perfect film and I think it's like one of the best ever, so I disagree. That would be fine. But no, what you get instead is people who are like, you're an effing F-bomb this. You don't know anything. You, and then their bottom lips start to quiver. <laughs> you said something bad about the Dark Knight. <laughs> you know, I can just picture them crying themselves to sleep in their pathetic little pillows in their pathetic little beds. Um, and they start going crazy and like take personal offense and how dare you, how dare you say something bad about a movie I love. Ah, you know, I've got this buddy of mine. Um, if you're a fan of the uh, great entertainment site HitFix, I got a buddy of mine who's one of the lead guys over there. His name's Chris Tapley. And uh, probably the best award season coverage guy on the internet. Love the guy. And just by looking at the shirt, you know how important Star Wars is to me. And he hates Star Wars. He thinks they suck. So, you know, him and I will, will talk about sometimes. He goes, oh, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Star Wars sucks. It's just so, so sucks. And I'm just like, whatever, dude. I think it's awesome. I think you're really missing the boat. I think it's great. You know, that's a discussion. But then you get, but then I'll say something online like, you know, Batman, a Batman, a live action Batman movie should never have a Robin. All right. I love Robin in the comic books, but in a live action film that's supposed to feel a little grittier, more real, I think it'd be actually stupid to have Robin, the 12 year old boy wonder. Wee! I just think that would be ridiculous and dumb. That's my opinion, whatever. And you're free to disagree. And that's great if you disagree. And I love reading good, solid, well thought out uh, arguments about, hey, no, John, I think this is why Robin can work, blah, blah, blah. I may not agree with you, but I really enjoy hearing different points of view. And that's great. But then you get some people who are like, once again, the quivering bottom lip, how, how dare you say something bad about Robin? I want to touch him. You know, the thing that you get these absolute morons out there. Um, who will then, who will just take it to 
personal offense. Oh, you said something. You said Robin shouldn't be in a Batman movie. My life is ruined. Like, it's, it's like I just went into their mailbox and stole their paycheck. I mean, so, yeah, what part of us as film fans drives me most nuts? They both really come down to the whole failing to recognize the subjectivity of film and being able to have different points of view and opinions and have friendly, intelligent conversation about it without having to change each other's minds. I mean, and one is the, you don't have credibility because you had something in number five instead of number four. And, but the biggest one to me is that people get really angry or personally offended if you dare say anything bad about either a movie they love or, or present a, a point of view that is different from their point of view. And they, they're so insecure and they're so mentally um, minute that they can't handle understanding that somebody else, that the way they think is not the way everybody else thinks. So, I mean, that's just the way it is. Look, I'll, and I'll have fun conversations with people. Like if they, because, you know, Man of Steel is my favorite movie of the year. just is. And somebody, a friend of mine would say he thought it was terrible. I'd say, you're an idiot. You're insane. But we say that jokingly because we both understand that film subjective. I know that film subjective. So does he. But we just like to talk passionately. That's cool. That's one thing. But it's like the visceral nature of some people who just are so, you know, incomprehensibly stupid that they can't grasp the subjectivity of film and understand that, hey, we're all film fans and you may like one thing, I may like another, and you may not like something I like, and that's all cool. That's crazy. That's the thing that drives me most nuts. All right, let's move on to the next question because I'm starting to run out of time here because I'm blabbering on so much. Isn't it odd that when I'm alone, I actually blab longer? Anyway, my wife always tells me, <laughs> she, my wife will sometimes watch AMC Movie Talk with me and she'll like turn to me or watch one of our mailbags or watch something else that I'm on, right? If I'm like, I do a, a radio show in Canada and I do a bunch of other things. And sometimes she'll look at me and my wife will go, when's the part that you don't talk? That's my favorite part because I, I'm, I'm long-winded, I know. All right, next part, next question comes to us from Jared Venekirk. Venekirk? I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Jared. I'm, I, my apologies if I'm not. Um, hi guys, I've been watching your show for quite a while now and I love it. Thank you so much, Jared. Uh, my friends and I have uh, love games and we love Halo. And I wondered if there will ever be a Halo movie because I believe it will make a lot of money. Hope you guys answer. Bye. <laughs> um, thanks a lot for the question. Yeah, Halo is, pardon me, is one of those um, really interesting Hollywood stories because you know the story. It was they were planning on making it. Peter Jackson was going to produce, and they brought in um, uh, Neil Blomkamp to direct. Studios got nervous about the spiraling budget, an unknown director, blah, blah, blah. Then the people pulled out, and Jackson said it was still happening anyway, and then it didn't happen at all, and all this. And then finally the plug got pulled. And that's going back six years now, maybe seven now. Um, but Halo is one of these franchises, it's so popular. I still believe, and some people call me crazy for this, and that's fine, but I still believe that we are eventually going to see us a Halo film. I have to believe it. There's, there's money to be made. And look, if you can trust anything in Hollywood, trust in the greed of studios. Just do it. Trust in the greed of studios. If they think there's really money to be made on a property, then they will make a movie on that property. They're in the business of giving the audience what they want. But I will say this, every year that passes that we don't have a Halo film, I do believe decreases the chances that we'll ever get one. Because Halo next year is not gonna be as popular overall as a brand as it is this year. Much like Halo is not as popular as a brand as it was last year or the year before that or the year before that. And I believe the most popular days of Halo are behind it. It's still mighty popular. But I believe it is not as popular as it was at one point. And my fear is that as each year passes, 
and we move further and further away from the peak of Halo's popularity, which is now in our rear view mirror. The peak of Halo popularity is in our rear view mirror. The further and further away we get from that peak, I believe the less and less of the chances are that we're finally going to get one. Um, and, and I believe, so I believe now is the time. I believe now is the time that these studios should be looking at this property and saying, we should start putting something together. Because we're not doing ourselves any favors and we're not doing the fans any favors by putting this off year after year after year after year. Let's do it now. Let's make this now. Because with the type of money I believe a Halo franchise could make now, you're still talking franchise money. So not only could it be a great film and, and a successful film, but if it is successful, then it's still popular. You can now spawn Halo 2 and Halo 3 and Halo 4, and that'll do nothing but boost the sales of the video game. So I don't understand the waiting. Now, at the same time, a lot of people have said the exact same thing about Last Airbender, about Dragon Ball Z. It's got all these billions of fans, and the movies come out and nobody goes see them. Now, you can make the argument well, that's because they, the movies were bad, but you don't know it's bad until the movie comes out, until until opening weekend and word of mouth starts going around. And so, I mean, it's a risk. I re I recognize it's a risk. But if I'm a studio executive today, I put the wheels in motion for a Halo film, and I do it as soon as I can. We don't rush it, but we start it as soon as we can, because I don't believe there's going to be a better time than today. So anyway, that's just my thought on it. All right, last question of the day, and this question comes to us from Sam Sammy Murphy, who writes. I wanted to ask you guys about reviews. And if a movie's early reviews are bad, will that affect the movie at the box office? Thanks for keeping me up to date uh, in movie news. I love your show. I watch it every day. Keep up the good work. Thanks a lot, Sammy. Um, this is actually a question I've addressed a lot uh, on the show, but it's always worth bringing up now and again for a minute. Um, yes, negative reviews and positive reviews do affect box office. A lot of people like to pretend they know something and say, no, they don't. Reviews don't mean anything. Because look, that movie got terrible reviews, but it made $300 million. Yes, but had that movie had great reviews, it would have made $400 million. So it does matter. Um, you know, this movie got great reviews, but only made $70 million. Yes, but if it had bad reviews, it probably would have made $50 million instead of 70. So the reviews do matter. I This is a story I've told before, but it's true. I had a studio exec tell me once that roughly speaking, there's exceptions, but generally speaking, reviews will give you a 10% swing either way. And what he meant by that was, if you have a movie that's going to make $100 million, let's go right down the middle, $100 million, the movie, regardless of, of uh, reviews, is going to make $100 million, Okay. If the movie has really bad reviews, that 100 million can suddenly become 90, 10% swing. If the reviews for that movie are great, could be $110 million that it makes. That's a difference between 90 and 110. That's now a $20 million difference. Now you take a movie like Avengers, which, hey, that movie was going to make 500 million no matter what you did. But really good reviews, Disney believes that the really good, huge hype and buzz from the critic community that happened before Avengers pushed it way beyond that. So give and take, it depends on the individual film, but I like what that exec told me that generally speaking, you'll have about a 10% swing. So yes, uh, bad reviews or good reviews will affect the box office. Don't listen to people who say, yeah, well, Transformers 3 had really bad reviews and it made $700 million. Yeah, that's fine. But if it had really great reviews, it would have made $800 million or $850 million or whatever. So yes, reviews do matter and they do count. Well, folks, um, that'll do it for me. I've gone over a half hour already because I, once again, I apologize that I blab on so long. But thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. AMC Mailbag will be back again tomorrow and Sunday. Dennis Zen is going to be hosting those. I believe Amy Rose Eisenbach is going to be joining them. Uh, and then we'll be back again on Monday with AMC Movie Talk. And listen, don't forget, um, on Friday, November 1st, 
me and the whole AMC Movie Talk crew, we are going to be doing a panel talking about comic book movies at Stan Lee's Kamikaze at the Los Angeles Convention Center. Once again, that's Friday, November 1st. It's 3.30 p.m. that we take to the main stage. So we hope to see you there. If you do, don't be shy. Come on up and say hi to us. We'd love to meet you. So uh, yeah, lots of great movies playing in AMC theaters everywhere right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. My name's John Campia for AMC Movie News, and until Monday, bye-bye.